Good morning YouTube and welcome to all the subscribers to my channel and if you're new to my channel welcome also. This is Sunday morning we can review the news of the week and boy do we have a lot of stuff to cover this week. So stay tuned because there's a lot of interesting facts that we're going to be going over that took place this week. Today is October 4th. It's Sunday morning. It's 8 a.m. Grab your coffee, have a seat, and sit back and enjoy your news. <music> As always, we're going to start off with the fun fact of the day. The wood frog can hold its pee for up to eight months. Just what you wanted to hear first thing, right? But it's pretty interesting. Talk about having to go. Wood frogs in Alaska have been known to hold their urine for up to eight months, sticking it out through the region's long winters before relieving themselves once temperatures increase. The urine actually helps keep the animal alive during the winter months while it hibernates. With special microbes in their gut, they recycle the urine into nitrogen that helps keep them alive instead of freezing to death. Fun fact of the day. <clears throat> now let's move on to what happened on this day in history on October 4th. This one's a pretty interesting one. Some of you might have been around, and you might remember this. In 1957, the Soviet Union launches Sputnik, the first artificial Earth satellite into elliptical low Earth orbit. So that's pretty cool. That was in 1957. Now let's move on to some of your weather real quick. We'll cover that before we get into some more interesting topics. All right. Um, this coming week in your weather, it looks like it could be a cooler than average for most of the country from the Great Divide to the east. Um, there will be some uh, precipitation that's going to be moving through out most of the areas uh, during the week. The west, on the other hand, is still dealing with that damn high pressure they just can't get rid of, and they are... Uh, under fire restrictions still, uh, there's been almost 3.8 million acres of land that has been burned out there. The fires are still raging. Um, so those people out there, they're, they're hurting. They're hurting really bad. So um, that's definitely the uh, hot spot, if you want to say, um, in the weather. So the, uh, we have a tropical depression 25 uh, strengthened into a tropical storm gamma. We are now in the Greek alphabet. That one is in the Western Caribbean Sea on Friday and supposedly according to the National Hurricane Center, that will be staying in the low Gulf and affecting Mexico and that area and will not be coming up towards the lower 48. So we'll be spared from that one. <clears throat> Scientists say the region's wildfires, talking about the fires out there in the West, are the worst in 18 years and have linked their increasing um, and intensity to climate change. However, the U.S. president has blamed poor forest management for the blazes. Now, he did do this uh, a week or so ago. Plumes of the smoke from the fires that are so large, they have crossed the U.S. and the Atlantic Ocean, carried by the jet stream, and have reached the skies of Europe. That's a long way. Because those fires are so big, they can, you can see it on the satellite image photos. It's just pretty wild. NASA captured the high-altitude smoke and associated aerosols particles in the air as they traveled east to New York City and Washington, D.C. in the middle of this last week. <clears throat> air quality is so poor, it's off the scale. Okay, 
The states of Oregon, Washington, and California are experiencing some of the most unhealthy air on the planet, according to the global air quality rankings. In some parts of Oregon, air quality has been so hazardous that it has gone beyond the scale of the state's air quality index. So basically, it's not safe to go outside at all. And you wonder how that's going to be affecting anything that they grow. If people have gardens, uh, fruit trees, any of this kind of stuff, all these toxic chemicals from the fires and everything else, um, that could be a very bad situation. And a lot of that stuff is getting blown across the country. So it's not just sticking there, it's getting picked up into the jet stream and is moving across the country and all the way over to Europe. Now let's go over to Ireland. Talk about a little news from Ireland. Bread and Subway's hot sandwiches contains too much sugar to meet Ireland's legal definition of bread. So there's too much sugar. The country's Supreme Court has ruled. The judgment was handed down on Tuesday in response to a Subway franchise who had appealed for a tax refund, arguing that its bread is a staple food and therefore subject to a 0% tax rate. Five judges considered the case, determining that Subway bread has too much sugar in it to be part of this category and therefore is subject to a higher tax bracket. <clears throat> well, doesn't that just beat all? Guess they need to drop the sugar content if they want to get that zero tax. So, this week, a uh, jobs report shows fewer hires as recovery losses or loses its momentum and job losses are increasing. However, permanent job loss increased by 345,000 to 3.8 million in total to a, a 2.5 million increase since February, the month before the World Health Organization declared the coronavirus a pandemic. Permanent job losses rose by more than 300,000, and that's not a good thing, is it? The labor force um, rate declined, which pulled the overall unemployment rate down the tubes and that's not a good sign either we're looking basically at state and local government layoffs we're looking at a higher level of permanent job losses because a lot of companies have just closed their doors and more people leaving the workforce none of that is good in the long run all right now we're sticking right with this as of um, August twenty, uh, August thirty first, twenty twenty, uh, the the Feds put out a um, basically what our national debt is, and the federal debt held by the public was twenty point eight three trillion. That's with a T. Dollars, and the government holdings were five point eight eight trillion dollars with a T for a total of a national debt of 26.70 trillion dollars. It's a lot of cash. And one of the questions that everybody should be asking is, is who's going to be paying for all this? We have all this debt and I would almost bet it's going to be us people in the middle class. We always get stuck with the bill. Moving on. Credit card debt was released this week. The credit card debt hit an all new time high and de delinquencies are rising sharply for younger people. Fortunately, most Americans are in much more solid financial shape than before the Great Recession. Americans owe nearly $1 trillion in credit card debt. Just credit card debt. 
And that's an all-time record high according to the report out this week from the Federal Reserve. And delinquencies and overdue payments are rising, especially among young people. Now, as a prepper, you may want to make try to make sure that you either pay your debt down, get rid of your debt, or whatever you need to do, so that maybe you can put that money towards being prepared in case of a disaster, any type of situation. Having that much debt, they say that the average person has roughly between six and eight thousand dollars in credit card debt. Now, I do not have any credit cards. Me and my wife worked very hard to pay off our credit debt, um, credit cards, um, quite a few years ago. Uh, kind of could see the writing on the wall and wanted to get out of that. So we did. Uh, we do have car payments and stuff like that, um, but we don't have credit card debt, which is a very good thing. Now, we all know this week, on Tuesday, the greatest show on earth came to town. In case you all missed it at 9 o'clock at night, it's Three Ring Circus. That's about all I can say about that. You know, you have a debate, you have no idea what the hell happened. Two guys over talking each other constantly through the whole damn thing. I watched a total of five minutes of it and I turned it off and went to bed because it wasn't worth my time. If you're gonna have a debate, people, I don't care if you're a Republican, Democrat, you wanna know what one has planned for the future of this country and how they're going to deal with all these situations that we have from the pandemic, from the national debt, who's gonna pay for this, what kind of plan you have for health care? how are you gonna take care of the American people that are still out of work, and all these big corporations that are going to, or, or have already started laying off people, letting people go, um, furloughs, the whole nine yards. What is the plan? If I want to turn on and watch two people go at it, I'll put the WWE on on Friday night and watch the fights. It's about the same damn thing. Only thing was they weren't touching each other, which was probably a good thing because we all know what happened come later on in the week. The theories that are out there around um, Trump's diagnosis with the COVID, you know, they're, they're running wild right now. All the... Uh, conspiracy theories and um, all this other kind of stuff. Uh, you just don't know what to believe anymore. It's just getting way out of hand. So, on Friday, early Friday morning at just before 1 a.m., President Donald Trump uh, announced that him and Melania had been tested positive for the COVID-19. So, President Donald Trump, who has frequently dismissed the significance of the COVID-19 pandemic and rarely wears a mask in public has contacted the coronavirus and now is in quarantine. He is also in Walter Reed Hospital being monitored there as, as far as when I'm shooting this video on Saturday. Um, he has a fever, fatigue, um, they say he's been coughing and all the congestion and this kind of stuff and he is being treated with um, certain types of drugs that are out there. Now I believe that they moved him there even though they have the ability to, to do whatever they need to to the president as far as the hospital care at the White House because basically they have their own. But I think they wanted to do it as a precautionary um, because usually after a few days, that's when the symptoms really kick in. So they thought it would be safer for him to be in a hospital environment where there are more doctors and equipment than what maybe they do have there. The news came a few hours after a number of news outlets revealed that Hope Hicks, a top advisor to the president, had 
contacted the virus. Hicks, who regularly travels with Trump, was, was, was with him for the debates, for the pre-debates and everything else this past week. Um, so that wasn't a very good thing. And now you are seeing on the news as of this morning um, that a lot of the advisors, a lot of the White House staff, a lot of these people are all coming down with the COVID-19. Now, one would think that if you have a group of scientists or as the CDC, and they are there for you to use and utilize the information that they do supply you, um, you would kind of heed their warning and basically just wear a mask. Now he has made fun of Biden wearing his mask everywhere he goes and everything else. Um, but in the end, the mask is what can protect you, especially if, if you are in a hot spot area. Now with him doing all his quote, um, meet and greets, his campaign trail and everything else, um, you see a lot of people that do not wear masks uh, at these events. Uh, he doesn't wear one at the events. Um, so, you know, it was only a matter of time. It's like playing Russian roulette. And in case you don't know what that means, you take a gun, you take one bullet, you put it in the chamber, you spin it, and you pull the trigger. If it doesn't go off, you survive another day. So eventually, it's going to go off, and you're not going to survive another day. So basically, it all caught up with him from not wearing a mask. It'll be quite interesting to see how he comes out of this and um, what his take on the whole situation will be from that point going forward. But time will tell. I'm sure somehow or another this will all be used into the political realm and for trying to gain momentum back into his campaign. Could be wrong. Time will tell. All right, so let's talk a little bit about a little something different. <clears throat> and uh, this next section is a little bit on... Uh, uh, Stephen Hawking and some of the stuff that he had to say um, basically right before he passed away. Now, Stephen Hawking, um, greed and stupidity are what will end the human race. Humanity has always been uh, prideful, but over time, new generations are becoming more and more self-centered. While I believe, him being Stephen Hawking's, our tendencies to be selfish is inborn. If not controlled, it's a powerful destructive force that might become a majority enemy. Now I do have some quotes and stuff in here and I will state that when I get to them from what he said word for word. During the last years of his life, he grew increasingly concerned about the future of humanity. We all know what's going on right now. Um, between all the protests and all the, the, the fires and all the destruction and the hurricanes and the flooding and everything else um, with the election, it's just basic chaos. Before his death, he kept warning the world, we are headed towards a point of no return, as our destroying activities would soon become irreversible. In 2016, during an interview with Larry King, he said, and quote, We certainly have not become less greedy or less stupid. Six years ago, I was worried about pollution and overcrowding. That has gotten worse since then. The population has grown by half a billion since our last meeting six years ago, with no end in sight. At this rate, it will be 11 billion people by 2100. Imagine trying to feed 2100 people with what is going on in the world today. 
not to mention health care for 21 or for 11 billion people in the year 2100. In a BBC interview, Hawking said, we are close to the tipping point where global warming becomes irreversible. Trump's actions could push the Earth over the brink to become like Venus with a temperature of 250 degrees and raining sulfuric acid. Climate change is one of the great dangers we face and it's one we can prevent if we act now. <clears throat> he believed that humankind is far from taking the much needed united and well-targeted actions. Quote, evolution has inbuilt greed and aggression to the human gene. There is no sign of conflict lessening and the development of militarized technology and weapons of mass destruction could make that disastrous. He maintained that some kind of a backup planet is the only way we can preserve our species when the earth would become entirely inhabitable. So as you can see here, what he was stating was, is we are slowly destroying where we live. And the only way that mankind is going to survive is to move to another planet. Now, what are they talking about in the news? In the news, they're all talking about they want to go to Mars. They're working on getting to Mars. You know, they want to get there. They want to colonize Mars and everything else. Why? Because eventually we ain't going to be able to live here. The planet is not going to take too much more of our bullshit that we're doing to them, to the planet. The best hope for survival, he said, of a human race might be independent colonies in space. There you go, folks. When it comes to artificial intelligence, which is highly beneficial on its own, Hawking's warned that it is now being used for the wrong purposes, as world governments are dangerously engaging in an AI arms race. A rogue AI could be the difficult to stop. We need to ensure that AI, artificial intelligence, is designed ethically and safeguards in place. He believed that if we are not careful, the rise of artificial intelligence will be the worst thing that has ever happened to us. Unless we will learn how to prepare for and avoid the potential risks, artificial intelligence could be the worst event in the history of civilization. It brings danger like powerful weapons or new ways for the few to oppress the many. It could be great disruption to our economy. Now on a closing note, with all that's going on and between the news, the weather, uh, political, the whole nine yards, if you're a prepper, you need to keep prepping. If you're not a prepper and you're just starting out, you need to start prepping. Start off small, work your way up. If you need to buy gear for a survival situation or whatever else, start small. You can always upgrade your products. Being prepared will maybe eventually save your life or your family's life or maybe even a friend's life you just don't know but really do you really want to take that risk of not being prepared very difficult for some people to do it right now because they don't have jobs they don't have money coming in and what money they maybe do get they're having to spend it on food to put it on their table they're facing evictions they're facing their power being turned off they're facing a lot of things, but we the people can change that. It's all in how you vote. It's all in what you believe in. I'm not saying 
if I'm a Republican or if I'm a Democrat, that's my opinion. You all have your opinions too. That's what makes America great. So until next time, get out, get registered to vote, do your research, and make your best decision. But in the meantime, I would highly suggest that you start prepping now because no matter which way this goes, it's going to get ugly, folks. It's only a matter of time. So be prepared. This is Survival Preparedness for Beginners. And until next time, I will catch you all on the flip side.